Pentagon officials have no plans to move ground troops out of bases in the Middle East in the wake of a fatal attack last month. But what measures will be taken to increase security on bases in the Middle East? Produced by Defense News and Military Times, this is the Early Bird Brief. Each morning, we bring you the defense and national security news of the day. Also today, as the threat from China looms, the Navy is working to address bottlenecks in missile production. What does this all mean for defense and security? You'll find out. I'm your host, Simone Perez. Today is Tuesday, February 7th, 2024. Hey there, listeners. Before we get started, we just wanted to let you know that we will be airing an interview with Representative Tony Gonzalez today at 1 p.m. Eastern. The wide-ranging interview with the Navy veteran turned lawmaker includes his take on Ukraine aid, border security, and the Israel-Hamas war, among other pressing issues in military life. So stay tuned. First up, U.S. Central Command continues to investigate how a drone was able to evade detection and kill three U.S. soldiers in Jordan. The Pentagon said Tuesday that there are no plans to move troops out of Jordan following the fatal drone attack on January 28th that killed three U.S. soldiers. Officials are mulling options for upgrading air defenses at Tower 22 in Jordan, where the attack took place, as well as at other small outposts across the Middle East. I'm not going to go into those conversations or or what um you know, changing our posture looks like, but that's absolutely something that is being discussed. That was Pentagon spokeswoman Sabrina Singh. Singh did not say whether any force protection changes would take place before CENTCOM has finished its review. The U.S. moved thousands of troops to the Middle East after the Israel-Hamas war began on October 7th. They hope to prevent Iran-backed militants from stirring up more conflict. Those mobilizations include a terminal high-altitude area defense battery and multiple Patriot missile air defense battalions to shoot down drones and missiles. Those air defenses have been successful and prevented a majority of attacks in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan. To date, those attacks include 67 in Iraq, 100 in Syria, and one in Jordan. More than 80 service members have been injured. For a majority, those attacks have been unsuccessful. We've seen a majority of those attacks have minor damage to infrastructure, incur minor Uh, casualties to our service members. Not saying we don't take those seriously, we absolutely do, but the impact of those on our bases has not been significant until of what happened at Tower 22. And that was tragic, absolutely tragic that we lost three service members and over 40 were wounded. Early unconfirmed reports have suggested that the drone was confused for a friendly that had been due to return around the same time. The Washington Post also reported Tuesday that the base only had electronic jamming equipment that missed the drone because it was flying too low and no systems for shooting the drone down. Increasing security measures could be the most feasible option for protecting troops in the Middle East for now. Thousands of troops remain deployed and teamed with local forces as part of a mission to prevent the resurgence of the Islamist terrorist group ISIS. Another important story, the Navy considers China its pacing threat, and efforts are underway to produce more weapons specifically geared toward a fight in the Indo-Pacific. For more on this, Naval Warfare reporter Megan Eckstein joins the episode. Hey, Megan, thanks for joining us. So you've done reporting on the Navy working to amp up its stockpiles of missiles, especially those they feel are essential in a fight against China. War games have played a part in sharpening U.S. strategy and where investments need to be made. How do those war games play out for the U.S.? There have been a number of war games looking at a scenario where the U.S. military is called to defend Taiwan from an invasion from China. There's one particular one that the Center for Strategic and International Studies ran at the end of 2022. The CSIS war game looked at a scenario where the U.S. Navy and Air Force would be called upon to protect Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. And what they found is that the U.S. Navy would need a ton of torpedoes. They call it happy time for the U.S. submarine fleet. And basically, the submarines would go in and shoot at everything China's moving across the street. So torpedoes would definitely be high in demand. Um, They also looked at the long-range anti-ship missile in particular, um, the Lorazum, and that would be very pivotal because it would allow aircraft to shoot at Chinese ships from much farther distances. 
So right now we have a very low inventory of these lorasms. And as soon as they were expended in the first, you know, couple days in some of these war games, it only took three or four days for the U.S. to run out of these. The aircraft could still drop bombs, but they would just have to get closer and closer and closer to their targets as they moved into shorter range missiles. And that just really creates a lot of risk. So the CSIS war game really showed the need to buy more torpedoes and more lorasm missiles. So what are industry leaders and lawmakers doing to open up or ease those bottlenecks? Starting in fiscal year 2022, the Navy really started to ramp up its weapons procurement spending. So between 2022 and 2024, they increased their request by 70 percent. Um, in 24, we saw a request of $6.9 billion for Navy munitions. And some of that was that the Navy wanted to start four multi-year procurement programs, which industry loves because the Navy is basically saying, we are going to buy this in this quantity for the next five years. You can plan your workforce, you can plan your factory expansions, um, and we're committing that we are going to buy this number for the next five years. So that was part of it. Um, the other part was that in the FY24 budget, the Navy also included $380 million, um, not for buying missiles, but rather just for shoring up the supply chain. Um, so what my reporting found is that there's a number of bottlenecks, um, whether it's microelectronics, whether it's rocket motors, um, whether it's you know, computer chips, like there are just certain parts where there's only one supplier on a missile or torpedo program. And, you know, in some cases, um, it might take, you know, dozens of weeks uh, to get these parts, and it's just slowing down production. So even though the Navy is spending billions and billions of dollars on weapons, they're not delivering on time, because um, very specific companies are having bottlenecks at their factories. So what the Navy and industry are doing now is trying to identify these specific suppliers that need help and find ways to put money towards expanding their factories, towards giving them advanced manufacturing processes that are more efficient, or whatever it will take to get them to be able to produce their part faster. That way missiles can start flowing to the Navy. Also on your radar for today, the military branch with the smallest percentage of women may also be disproportionately good at retaining them. That branch is the Marine Corps. According to re-enlistment and retention data from the Marine Corps, the service retains women at higher rates than men in almost every demographic and category, and in some cases, that's by a wide margin. The Corps enlisted retention rate is relatively low compared to some other services. That's a function of the service's operational requirements and young, high-turnover workforce. So let's break down the numbers. In fiscal 2023, 28% of first-term male Marines opted for re-enlistment, while 35% of women did. That's a spread of 7 percentage points. The year before, 24% of first-term men re-enlisted, while 32% of women did. That gap was narrower, but still pronounced for second-term enlisted Marines. In 2023, 43% of second-term males re-enlisted, compared with 47% of second-term females. Fiscal year 2022 saw a similar 41% to 46% second-term re-enlistment gap. Service data shows this trend has been observable since at least fiscal year 2019. Overall, the female re-enlistment rate for women was 33% compared to 28% for men. But continuation rates are closer among Marine officers. In fiscal 2023, 90% of female officers opted for continuation compared to 88% of men. The year before, 92% of officer women and 90% of officer men stayed in the service. The gap holds true across the past five years. Here's why it matters. These trends are especially remarkable because they have no parallel among the other services who also presented retention data to the Pentagon. A RAND researcher and female Marine Corps veteran told Marine Corps Times that troops of color tend to stay in uniform longer than their white counterparts, at least until a certain career seniority point. That's relevant because women still make up a small minority of Marines at roughly 10% of the total force. And now here's some other stories we're hearing chirps about. Authorities said two ships traveling in Middle East waters were attacked by suspected Houthi rebel drones early yesterday. The Navy removed the commanding officer of the Japan-based destroyer Howard yesterday, less than six months after relieving the previous skipper of the ship. The Hill reported that a State Department spokesperson said this week the United States did not notify the Iraqi government ahead of U.S. military strikes inside the country on Friday. That counters an earlier White House message that Baghdad was told ahead of time. 
and according to the Dutch Defense Ministry, the Netherlands scrapped plans to sell six F-16 fighter jets to a U.S. company and will prepare the planes for delivery to Ukraine instead. And on this day in history in 1984, Navy Captain Bruce McCandless II became the first human to perform an untethered spacewalk. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Simone Z. Perez. Today's episode featured stories by Megan Myers, Megan Eckstein, and Hope Hodgsack. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Gruse. Have a great day. <laughs>